Hello, everyone. Welcome to Access Chat. Uh, today, uh, we are being joined by um, one of my good friends um, and a friend to all of us in the disability community. And Neil is not joining us. He might join us late, but um, we do have Antonio here. So uh, welcome, everyone, to Access Chat. Um, Alejandro is joining us today, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about the work he's doing. So Alejandro, why don't you start and Tell us a little bit about your background and the work you're doing, and then let's talk. You know, let's start talking about what you're doing to really make a difference for people with disabilities. So, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and I'm very glad to to be here with you. And uh, well, basically, my name is Alejandro Moledo, and I work as a policy coordinator at the European Disability Forum. And the European Disability Forum (EDF) is the umbrella organization that represents persons with disabilities before the European Union institutions. So basically we are a platform that brings together all those uh, organizations of persons with disabilities at European level, such as the European Blind Union, the European Union of the Deaf, Autism Europe, Inclusion Europe, representing people with intellectual disabilities, and also those organizations at national level in each member state that also represent um, cross-cutting disability perspectives. So we are mainly an advocacy organization towards the, the institutions um, of the EU. And for the past five years, I've been uh, working and responsible for the work on, of EDF um, concerning access to, to new technologies, so basically accessibility to, to the ICT, information and communication technologies, and um, it's been a, an amazing uh, experience for me, which I'm really happy to, to continue now in a new position as coordinator, focusing also on other topics as well, on political participation and our overall advocacy towards the European Parliament. And uh, as I was saying, it has been really amazing because in the past five years, uh, I was lucky to, to, to witness uh, the, the great progress that the EU has uh, achieved uh, with regards to, to, to the legal framework, the laws uh, concerning e-accessibility. We have, se we have seen the, um, well, we can talk about them, um, important milestones uh, with regards to web accessibility, the first directive on, on accessibility for the websites and mobile applications of public sector bodies. We've seen the revision of important legislation re with regards to audiovisual and uh, audiovisual media services and telecommunications. And we've seen the, the recent um, adoption of the European Accessibility Act, which has been one of the main flagship initiatives and campaigns from the European Disability Movement uh, calling for a legislation uh, on accessibility for products and services, which uh, ended up being a, a very good legislation that has um, a very strong component on ICT that we can talk about. And unfortunately, it it fell short on, on important aspects with regards to transport, with regards to the access to the built environment. So it has also its shortcomings, but all in all, this has been uh, an achievement that uh, we hope it will have a, a, an impact in the everyday lives of persons with disabilities. So finally, Europe um, catch up uh, with, with the US on, on, mm -hmm. on the accessibility uh, domain, let's say. So, so uh, Alessandro, so you know, over the cast, over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of discussions about the European digital single market. Uh, uh, do you see uh, uh, the same of level of energy of uh, uh, creating a, a space in Europe where people with disabilities are getting the same attention in relation to how they can be, you know, looked from a, 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 a service perspective? Uh, do, do you see that happening? Uh, well, I, I see that the well, the euro. I mean, the EU, the European Union. Uh, I mean, we can talk about general politics, but we see that now the EU is is in a moment of uh, let's say um, crisis. I would say internal crisis on 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 how to how to move forward. So the we we. We also we also felt in the discussions on the policies um, 
with regards to persons with disabilities, this kind of different position with regards of what the EU as a whole, as a regional organization, which by the way has ratified, is the inter uh, regional organization that has ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and all its member states uh, as well, finally. So we, we've seen also in our domain this kind of trends, uh, towards more integration, towards just um, legislate the internal market, towards being a more social Europe, towards um, being a more human rights based uh, um, Europe. So all these conflicting um, trends or positions, uh, we also felt them in, the, in our discussions, even though there is a common agreement to, to advance the rights of persons with disabilities, the way to achieve this, uh, this objective is very different depending on which um, stakeholder or which policymaker you are talking to. So we, we have the good practice of the web directive, for example, but we also have for more than 10 years the directive on anti-discrimination, what we call the the, um, the equal treatment directive, uh, a directive um, on anti-discrimination, so against the discrimination on the grounds of disability, among other um, uh, vulnerable groups, uh, let's say. This directive has been stuck in the Council uh, because of a couple of member states since uh, more than 10 years, and we still don't have an anti-discrimination legislation in the EU. So, in 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 our in our um, domain, we see this these converging forces and this kind of uh, lack of common understanding on common uh, ground on how the EU should uh, um, work. I don't know if that answers uh, more or less your question, <laughs> or I went too to, to much on, on general to uh, politics. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's, no, that, no, that really puts things in, into perspective, because I've been following uh, the events, and, and you, you, by following sometimes conversations on Twitter, you, you see the different tones uh, yeah, coming from exactly. different countries, different sectors, some countries exactly. really trying to move forward and act faster, and exactly. even some people from the Commission who really want to make things happen, exactly. and then you see that somebody is holding things, uh, oh, uh, we need to delay, you know, we need to go back to our parliament, we need, so exactly. you, you, see, you see those forces. But I, I think it will be uh, um, looked uh, to observe how even if we don't really have this kind of a general agreement uh, across the European countries, what countries are already decided to move uh, forward uh, in, in their own, you know, uh, at the national level? Uh, and might not be waiting for this to happen. They may decide, okay, uh, this is, we are basically stopped here, but we, might do, be able to do something by ourselves. So, so in the past, we had people from the government from uh, Norway on, on here on Access Chat, where they were explaining us how they engage with business in order to find ways where um, business are un understanding the needs of people with disabilities, how the websites are accessible, uh, how they educate uh, uh, somehow the community on that. We, we had Susanna Lauren from, mm -hmm. from Funke, from, from Stockholm. So we see that some countries are somehow doing uh, their yeah. own effort in order to... So I, I think what probably we need, we need to talk more about uh, the countries that are doing this right. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, and it's, it's one of our mission at EDF is to to facilitate this conversation and this exchange of best practice. So this, we we also work a lot on on building the capacity of the of our members. So on the different organizations of persons with disabilities across Europe. So we also work on this exchange of knowledge, exchange of know-how. Um, on, on what a country, like you mentioned, Norway is a very good example. I would also say that my, my home country, Spain, is, is also um, um, uh, taking very good initiatives with regards to, to persons with disabilities. And uh, we need to put this uh, on the agenda of, of the other countries, uh, but also on the agenda of the EU as a whole, because the EU, um, sometimes we forget about the, the importance of the EU or we take it for granted, but the EU has a, um, is, 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 is a unique project uh, worldwide that can actually uh, make things happen 
with the right political will and it's a it's a great forum to exchange this kind of policies and go for the best i mean take the best out of the different initiatives on national level but but, but what we discussed before the problem is that these converging forces like some uh, countries just uh, they, they just want the eu to deal with the internal market others they want to go a bit more social but not too much because the social policies are a national competence and so forth so these kind of uh, discussions are very important um, for politicians, but also for NGOs and civil society organizations. And this is something that at EDF we 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 bear in mind, and we and we focus a lot on this exchange of good practices and and building the capacity of our members. I I noticed that when y'all one thing that I really like about the there's so many things I like about the work you're doing, Alejandro, but. Um, one thing that we noticed in the U.S. was this: um, the, these, you know, things that you were putting out. We found them very valuable, and I, I there was there's a lot of U.S. multinational corporations that were actually considering that what you're doing in the EU is um, easier for them to easy is probably not the right word, but it it. Um, in really making sure that they are being accessible, they think that you do a better job of explaining what you expect from them to be accessible. Where mm -hmm. some of the law, other laws that we've seen in other countries, including in the United States, it's so vague that uh, often I, I will see corporations going out trying to be accessible, and then they're like, "Okay, is that is that what you wanted? Okay, mm -hmm. is this what you wanted?" And then of course we like to answer them in the U.S. Um, and we talked about this before we went on air. You know, we were litigating mm -hmm. a lot in the United States, yeah. and our litigation is messy and problematic and causes divides. But at yeah. the same time, it but is it's actually also driving advanced. Force as well. yeah. It's driving force. It's and you know, we wish we didn't have to do that. Yeah. Uh, we wish more so that corporations saw the value in including everyone, yeah. which includes yeah. people with disabilities in it. Yeah. And by the way, I think they do. But I've also heard from, there was a very large um, corporation in the United States that said, um, that has been working on accessibility for years. And mm -hmm. they said, we do not think that the accessibility community is able to really help us because yes, you have your standards and you tell us to do all this stuff, but actually applying this to a multi-billion dollar corporation with all these moving parts and all these, you know, M&A activities and everything that's happening, um, they said it's not always very practical. And I've also seen some organizations, some corporations, small accessibility corporations in the U.S. sending out blogs saying, who are you going to call if somebody comes suing you? Mm -hmm. Well, just have your lawyers call us. And so, some corporations are not feeling that they are getting the support they need to truly be accessible. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that's happening all over the world. So I think it's why the work that you're doing and what we're doing here at Access Chat, continuing to turn up the volume on these conversations, mm -hmm. I think it is more critical than ever because I, I believe corporations want to do this. And I understand that's a stretch because some of them want to do it because they don't want to get sued. Some of them want to do it. They know it's the right thing, but there's a lot of confusion, a yeah. lot of confusion about how do we actually do this and what does this mean? And how does this tie with all of the technology disruptions that's happening? And mm -hmm. it's, um, it, that's why I think the work that you are doing is so important because I know every time the EU does something or the UK is doing something, we're watching and we're trying to figure out how can we use that to help these corporations and other entities be more mm -hmm. successful with disability inclusion. Yeah. And one more comment. I know that we have disability indexes and stuff in the United States, and which is a really good effort, but often accessibility is being left out of those indexes. And yeah. I'm sorry, you can't, you can't have true disability inclusion if your HR processes aren't accessible or your website or anything else. So mm -hmm. you cannot leave accessibility out of these conversations and inclusive design and all that. So. I think once again, that's another really good reason why the work you're doing is so important. Yeah, well, I mean, you you touch upon many many topics that yeah, I, I, I want to react, but um, let's let's start with the the. I mean, you you say that some. I mean, strategic litigation is a driving force. We know that, and and actually, uh, sometimes I. I, I I can confess that I, I wish we could have uh, uh, some more uh, strategic litigation in Europe, because sometimes um, we lack that kind of uh, um, proactive uh, um, 
uh, reaction to to when 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 there is an infringement of 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 the legislation and and that brings me to to what you mentioned at the beginning that um sometimes it's not clear what accessibility means um, because accessibility is a vague term and sometimes that's that's the case and and we should acknowledge in the disability community that uh, that accessibility is not a black white issue we know that there is a a huge range of grays in between and um and therefore there are many different levels of accessibility accessibility that you can require in a legislation. I'm talking just about the legislation at the moment. Um, therefore, you should be clear on what accessibility means um, when you require accessibility. And we've seen, uh, for instance, in the use of the of the EU funds, you know, when there is a, um, a programs that are funded by the by the European um, Union, there is an obligation, an ex ante uh, obligation to to make sure that those funds uh, are, um, are uh, funding, sorry, accessibility or accessible product services, infrastructures, uh, built environment, and so forth. The problem is that sometimes um, that's just uh, a requirement that stays in paper, but not in practice because the people managing the funds, the people procuring the the the, the bidders or the companies applying to to to, to those tenders, like um, I'm, I, I, you you want me to develop a new mobile application? Okay, uh, here you have it. But those that apply to those uh, contracts uh, and need to make them accessible, sometimes they don't, they don't know because the procurers don't know either what accessibility means. And that's why it's very important. And I think that's one of the um, really good practice from, from the US in, with regards to accessibility legislation to set out like really clear accessibility requirements in the legislation, which are then um, further detailed in, in, in a standard, in accessibility standard, which is in the end a technical document that the companies are using to, to develop their products, their services, their infrastructure, and so forth. So what the, the problem that we, we saw, as I was mentioning, is that sometimes public procurement, which requires um, to, to take into account accessibility and design for all users, the use of EU funds and so forth, there was not uh, a clear uh, understanding of what this means. So they were converging, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, diverging, so conflicting understandings on what this means at national level. So for one country, accessibility means this, for another one, it means that. But something very positive of the EU is that they can approximate those laws, those understandings, and have a common approach to, to accessibility and what it means, at least to a certain level, to a minimum level. And this is what the Accessibility Act, the, the recently adopted Accessibility Act, is, um, is aiming at, is setting out very clear accessibility, functional accessibility requirements for a set of products and services which are mandatory for public procurement as well. So when a public authority will procure um, a ticketing machine, for example, they will know that uh, these are the accessibility requirements that they need to ensure in their technical specifications. And then from, those, from these requirements, we will have uh, standards, which are these technical documents that the companies will use. And therefore, we'll have um, certainty that they will be in conformity of the legislation. So clear, um, accessibility requirements is fundamental. So first, the obligation, of course, to the obligation, the accessibility provision, then accessibility requirements, clear accessibility requirements, leading to accessibility standards. And then I would say also, as you have in the US, uh, a, a strong enforcement mechanism. And this is something that, for instance, in Europe, uh, we are lacking with regards to public uh, procurement, because if you're a citizen and you see that suddenly your government has created a, this new bridge, uh, to cross the, the road, the, the highway, and that bridge is not accessible for people using wheelchairs, you cannot, uh, I mean, you can complain, you can do the, the city hall to court, but who's going to do that? I mean, we should have more robust enforcement mechanisms to ensure that citizens, they can uh, lodge complaints and they can defend their rights and they can go and say, hey, this is not appropriate. You need to make sure that the obligation is actually fulfilled. And for that, we need uh, strong legislation, a strong le legal framework, and a strong and robust uh, enforcement uh, mechanisms to, for the users and the citizens to, to claim their rights and make sure that everybody complies. So we are 
I would say that at Europe, in Europe, we are still lagging behind with um, compared to the to the US still. But I mean, now there is a chance that in the coming years we we can finally catch up. No, here, here in Cork, um, we have a, a st we have two two projects. One is called Cork Healthy Cities. Uh, and the other is the, the Cork, the, the Irish Participation Network, uh, that is uh, um, represents the, um, the areas like social inclusion within local government. Mm -hmm. So, and in, in the I, I've been I became a member of that in in the last two, in the last two years, and we started to bring the conversation about uh, accessibility uh, accessibility. The conversation on inclusion was already part of it, but we, st we started to launch conversations about uh, accessibility requirements in the projects that we have been developing. Mm -hmm. So what the, the groups do is advising on policy, and we are slowly starting to embed uh, requirements to have discussions about accessibility uh, in everything that in, in everything that we do. So this was something that was not there. But what I found is uh, people were just not doing it because they were not aware, not because they didn't want it to do it. So we have built that and we are trying to uh, find ways that local government understand the needs because we, we have seen people talking about, oh, uh, smart city projects, oh, we are going to make this city a smart city. But what does that mean, you know? Yeah. What is the meaning of a smart city if uh, you, people are not able to navigate through the city and you are just talking about building, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a lot of the technology or a tram that go from A to B, but then someone uh, with a wheelchair is not able to access to that tram or the roads or the footpath is very is really nice and beautiful for someone that is cycling, but then a visually impaired user wants to cross the road and there's the, the, the bicycle track in the middle and is at risk. So we are trying to have that conversations and we see that people are open to it, uh, but it, it's, it, we have seen that uh, developments uh, here uh, in Cork, but I see that is more and more important to try to to uh, engage in, in these like, small forms of public policy, but at the same time trying to you you know you mentioned at the beginning of the forum that you, you are re representing different groups uh, within Europe, and what I we, I found here in Cork is we need to find ways to bring the different groups of uh, of people within disabilities to us because they are somehow separate. Uh, and it has been, it has been difficult for us to find sometimes uh, a, a group locally that uh, would operate like, uh, like EDF, that we can talk with them and then they can reach out their different communities. That has been our challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the meaningful participation on, of, um, of persons with disabilities of um, like um, the great ex them possible and the, the, uh, as many um, people as possible, as, uh, as diverse as possible is, is crucial, is fundamental. Otherwise, um, that's how you achieve actually a, a, a design for all approach. And um, it, it, that's why it's, it's very important, and sorry to go back to my previous um, uh, response, it's very important to establish this minimum level of accessibility based on a set of accessibility requirements, but then and this is when it comes to, to, to your example, um, it's very important as well uh, to build on top of those. So the legislation can give you like the, the minimum, let's say the, the adequate level that everybody should ensure, but then uh, on top of that, in addition to, to that, we need to take into account the, the environment, the context of use, because maybe Cork, uh, where you live, is not the same, I'm sure it's not the same as my hometown in Spain or uh, Oslo in Norway. So we need to take into account those, those aspects as well. Um, therefore, um, having a, a, a legal framework that, that, that can help us all to, to ensure a minimum level doesn't mean that with that we are we are done. No, no, no. We need 
also best practices and we need to go beyond and we need to uh, bring people, bring different uh, um, disability groups, uh, um, organizations of older people, um, as, as many. I mean, in the end, it's all about embracing human diversity and uh, make the, our societies inclusive to, to, to all. So that can only be achieved through meaningful uh, involvement of everybody. I agree. No, I agree. Uh, uh, so, some, something that we decide to do in this, uh, in the, in this groups is in, in the past, uh, the, the meetings, they used to be hosted in the central place, like the city council. Mm -hmm. And everything happened in there, and we decided to move uh, the events to the uh, to host in different organizations within the mm -hmm. city. So, last uh, the last meeting that we had happened at a, an organization that supports training for people with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. So this allow all the members of the of the group to go there. Uh, we host the meeting there and allow them to know more about that organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did uh, a meeting about uh, uh, last year uh, on, on a, a group that works with sexual, uh, sexual harassment. So mm -hmm. we, we, we are somehow decided to, to, instead of being a centralized meeting in one place, to go around the city to, to allow the members to know the different organizations and also uh, si signaling to those organizations that we have an interest on and listening to them. So we, we shifted, uh, shifted that a, a little bit to, to also to, to put us a little bit out of our own comfort zones. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And I would also say another thing that you talked about, Alejandro, when you're talking about the procurement aspect of it, Mm -hmm. That's something that we think is so critical. And I know that I was working on that years ago with the U.S. government. And we have something called a GSA schedule that uh, technology providers um, join so that it's easy for the U.S. government to buy technology products for them. Mm -hmm. But we found that very few of those providers were actually, you know, um, thinking about our Section 508, which is accessibility. And mm -hmm. so I know that James Thurston with G3ICT and Susan Scott Parker with BDI have both been making a lot of efforts together, and I think a little together as well, on mm -hmm. the procurement aspect, because if we can solve accessibility at the procurement level, we're going to solve a lot of problems. And I Indeed. was saying to the U.S. Yeah, I said the U.S. government years ago that you actually take some of the burden from the government and place it on the providers by making sure that language is in there. Because if you have it across the board the expectation that everybody has to comply with our laws, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which says everything ICT has to be accessible, then you're sort of you're sort of taking care of it at that point, sort of. Mm -hmm. And and then the grassroots efforts that Antonio yeah. is talking about that they're doing in Cork. I think it's all of these moving parts and. And I agree with what you're saying to Alejandro. You know, we it's very messy here in the United States and it's very, you know, combative. But at the same time, if we didn't have what we call the carrot and the stick approach, if we didn't have that stick, there's no way we would have made the progress that we've made in the United States. And we have so far to go, but it's almost like we've swung a little bit to a problematic area and that our lawyers are very smart and we appreciate that they hold you know uh, entities accountable to follow our laws we mm -hmm. we do appreciate that we wouldn't have safety belts we wouldn't have backup cameras yeah. so we don't all accidentally back over our children i mean they're they play the lawyers play an important part but we've all we also saw um it, it was we we were sort of scared of um something we were seeing in the states and that lawyers were suing corporations because they weren't accessible and money was being made by the lawyers but the lawyers were not holding the companies accountable to go ahead and make their their applications their internet their websites their hr processes accessible so the companies were getting sued but nothing was happening and so we have leaders like laney feingold who has been on access chat before and others that have said no and uh, joe manning who is a lawyer that's very active in this he part of the litigation is that you must 
make whatever you're suing you about, it must be accessible. That's part of, yeah, you're going to pay a really, really big fine um, mm. and a lot of money. And, you know, the corporations don't want um, this to hit our press and this to talk about they're a bad corporation online, this brand risk and all that stuff. But there's some hopeful things happening with our litigation and that, that our lawyers are starting to now say, no, you actually have to fix this because, and by the way, and pay all this money too. So mm -hmm. that there's hopeful signs, but I think it's, it takes all of this. It takes the grassroots efforts. It takes, you know, all of the countries deciding how to do it. It takes the CRPD. It's, it's all of the moving parts. And then of course the leaders that are engaged in these conversations. And I know Alejandro, you and I've known each other for years and you have a, a wonderful career of really trying to make a difference in this space. So you know, thank you for your leadership, your ongoing leadership. Well, we, we do our best. We do our best. And I think... It's a good uh, <laughs> So, um, yeah, no, no. And I, I think it's, it's the, the push of the um, of grass, grassroots and the push of the um, disabled people organization, the push of uh, so many different civil society organizations in these travel times. Uh, I, I mean, it, it does make a difference. And, and now, I mean, we see also some pushback from other other groups and, and, and we need to, to stay firm and, and keep moving forwards because, uh, I mean, otherwise um, we won't be realizing the motto of the disability movement, nothing about us without us. So we should be there and we should be in the discussions that affect our lives in all these areas and we should also uh, embrace uh, diversity ourselves and collaborate with other civil society organizations. We are doing that at EDF. The other day, for instance, we had a, a training uh, to get to know ILGA Europe, which is the organization representing LGTBI um, issues, and we found that they, we had so many um, like challenges in common, and we we found that we had so many like points in which we could collaborate. So it, it's it's very important also to 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 open open up to 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 collaborate with others and build build uh, alliances and and also overseas no in uh, from europe to to the us to the pacific to african countries to asia to latin america i mean in the end this is all about us and 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 we need to be we need to be um involved from the from the outset and and that brings me if uh, i may um to something that i wanted to share with you uh because um for the Global Awareness Accessibility Day, we yes. at EDF, we will be launching uh, this report that I'm showing uh, is um, a report titled Plug and Pray, a disability perspective on artificial intelligence, automatic decision making and emerging technologies. And I believe that this is an area in which we see that there is a huge impact for persons with disabilities, uh, both on the side of like positive outcomes, but also on risks and concerns with regards to uh, bias, discrimination, uh, further barriers, further barriers to access ICT and so forth. And we thought that uh, now that it seems like artificial intelligence and all these what we call emerging technologies are drawing so much attention from for um, our um, tech companies and policymakers and so forth. It's very important that we get involved now as soon as possible and we um, we have our say and we engage in meaningful conversation with everybody about this before it's too late and then we need to go back and retrofit the thing and and and, and it's more cost uh, uh, costly and so it's a moment to to start like talking about this and 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 and, and be involved agree agree yeah. No, I, I had a, a conversation uh, yesterday with someone that usually does a lot of training with the uh, developers mm -hmm. uh, uh, in many different areas and he was telling me uh, at the moment uh, the training that we need to do you know that would impact would have an, an impact on, on AI and bias and, uh, and the, uh, the training that we need to do with developers is not about code 
-hmm. Okay, we need to change the way out they look to the environment around them about empathy. Mm -hmm. So you was telling me we don't really, at the moment uh, my training sessions with technical people are not are 80% non-technical because that's yeah. where we need to uh, uh, bring our focus in 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 terms of in terms of their training because they seem to be missing out and not having the ability to listen, considering that the level of complexity of what they are doing has, has reached a level. So we need to make sure that we fill in those gaps in order to, to avoid some risks that can have social impact. Indeed, indeed. This, this is a, a huge challenge for the tech um, industry, I would say, because um, first of all, um, the data sets that, uh, uh, in which these uh, artificial intelligence solutions are um, based uh, are usually biased. So um, are usually thinking that, um, that um, um, a wedding, for example, should be in, a, in, a, in this certain way, in the Western way, so the woman in a white dress, the man with a tuxedo or something. So there will always be this, this bias that we need, the tech, com the tech community and the society as a whole, we need to correct, trying to look for fairness, even though this is a very, very, very difficult concept to, 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 to put clearly in a technology solution. But the, the key here is to, as you mentioned, is to make them understand, uh, uh, to, to, to open their eyes and see that there is not such a thing as an average user. They always think of um, um, a white young man that is very keen and fancy on technology that will sort the, uh, his way out, in a, will know how to do things, even though the, the layout may change every now and then, and it will get more difficult. So we need to, to, to for, for the developers, uh, we also need to be in contact with them, and we need to discuss with them, and we need to show them that the, 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 um, the people are, are diverse, and the different um, uh, contexts of use in which you, you are going to um, put the technology um, to work are very different from each other. And similarly, the procurers of that technology, so imagine that a company wants to purchase a, an artificial intelligence-based uh, application to run the recruitment of a, a recruitment process, so that company must make sure that the AI solution won't discriminate against people who are not uh, tagged as the average or the kind of um, the, the 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 average user or the average uh, person that they they have in mind. So the AI solution does not discriminate people who may be seen as different because of the biased data set. So all this is a huge challenge. I mean, it's, it's really exciting discussion. There are very exciting discussions about it. And the disability community, we need to be there. And we need to make our voices heard as well there. Because this is uh, definitely a driving force in the, in the coming years in many society. It can be a huge enabler for many uh, societies and many many people, including persons with disabilities. In, it can support our uh, participation um, in, uh, in all aspects of life and our, and our independent living. Think of like mm, smart homes, uh, robotics, um, virtual and voice assistants that are already available on the market. All these solutions will tend to get more and more present in our everyday life. Smart home appliances. I mean, I can't wait to have a, a, a smart washing machine, which doesn't mean that it does my, my laundry for me, but I can control it from my smartphone using my assistive technology. So all these things are coming, are already there, and we need to make sure that these um, solutions are actually designed for as many people as possible. Well said, well said. And, and you had made a point, I, I just want to remind the disability community of this, but you had made a point earlier about nothing about us without us. People with disabilities have to be in these important conversations and the, the mainstream conversations about the AI and the robotics and the 
autonomous vehicles and the internet of things. I totally agree. And that, once again, we're trying to do those conversations on access chat and other places. But at the same time, I do want to remind the community of people with disabilities, we also have to walk the walk. We are actually seeing more disability organizations and groups that support people with disabilities getting sued because they're not accessible. If you're if the people that you're trying to support, your members, your customers, the you know, are people with disabilities and you're a disability organization, you have to follow the rules too. You also have to be accessible. And it I, I had one group come to me and they're like, We we're getting sued and I'm like, Well, what you do for a living is outfit cars so that people with disabilities can drive them. How, wh why would you not be accessible? Of course, I didn't talk to them like that because we don't want to discourage them, but we also have, have to walk the walk within our own community, which is interesting. But Alejandra, I, I think we could talk to you day uh, for just days. We yeah. just appreciate everything you're doing and, and we can't wait to see that report come out on uh, GAD. So happy yeah. uh, Global Accessibility um, Awareness Day that's coming up on May 16th. But uh, we, we want to take the time to thank Barclays Access, Microlink, MyClearText for all of the ongoing support that they do with Access Chat. Antonio, I don't know if you wanted to make a final comment. I, I can turn it over to you. I can no, see no. you look eager to say something, and I want to make no, sure. No, I no, no, I, no, no, no. I, 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 I actually, I was just uh, uh, keeping myself reminded uh, to say thank you to them, just in case you weren't. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I <laughs> <laughs> no, we're excited about that. We're so excited yes. about it. And, yeah, yes, and we we've are. had the founders on before talking about it, but, you know, we all need to celebrate GAD, you know, and yeah. I'm so, I'm really glad you're putting out that report. Um, but, you know, and even little things like, and I've got, I'm, I don't want to be the mother of the group nagging, but we'll see, you know, wonderful, um, you know, reports come out and, and often they're not, oftentimes they're not accessible. It's like, yeah. so we also have to walk the walk. Uh, we as the community and um, it's we surprising. Even it. We even produced it also in easy to read as well. Oh, good, good, good. So, yes. So, you know, it, it's it's like um, we, we hear people whining about captioning videos. It's so, it's so hard. I don't care if it's hard. We all yeah. have to walk the walk to show everybody else, you know, this is the way we lead. We include everybody. I don't care if it's an extra hassle, do it and um, it's becoming easier and easier to do as well. But yeah. that's what we're trying to do. So we really, really appreciate your leadership and everything you're doing and um, looking forward to getting that report. So thank you for being on Access Chat today. Thank you for the invitation.